Welcome to the first Omnibus here on Geekdom 101. What we're going to do on this is compile together everything we know, all the information that's been gathered from all the Super Saiyan forms from Dragon Ball Z. And with this Transformation God Omnibus, we're going to focus exclusively on the forms from Dragon Ball Z, not the ones from the movies or from Super or from GT. Just the classic Dragon Ball Z transformations. By the end of this, you will know everything about all of the original Super Saiyan forms in DBZ. Let's start right now. I, Vegeta, the Prince of all Saiyans, orders you to subscribe and follow Geekdom 101 on these social media platforms. When talking about the classic golden haired Super Saiyan transformation, I feared making this video because I knew it was going to be very, very long because let's be honest, there's a lot to talk about. Super Saiyan is one of the most iconic transformations and state of beings in all of anime. Pretty much everyone on earth who has digested any form of media, even if you've never seen Dragon Ball Z, you know what a Super Saiyan looks like even if you don't know what it's called. And there have been so many explanations and retcons and various versions of the story on how Super Saiyans work and which characters became Super Saiyans. So, to make this video as simple as possible here in the Geekdom 101 Transformation Guide, we're not going to focus on specific characters. We're going to focus on the actual Super Saiyan transformation, how it works, what triggers it, where Toriyama got the idea from. All that stuff will be featured here on this edition of the Geekdom 101 Transformation Guide as we discuss the Super Saiyan. As Toriyama was writing his manga weekly in Shonen Jump, he had to figure out new and creative ways to showcase his characters becoming stronger and stronger visually so that the reader could easily understand and thus that's where the concept of transformations really became a thing in Dragon Ball. Now transformations have always and probably will always be a trope of Shonen as it is a relatively easy way to show the reader growth within the power of the character visually. And as Toriyama was writing his manga, the idea of a Supa Saiyajin, as it's stated in the Japanese version, was teased from the very beginning of the Dragon Ball Z portion when Nappa briefly mentions a Super Saiyan. And as we go into the Frieza saga, we keep hearing about this legendary myth about a Super Saiyan who will one day rise and attain an incredible amount of power, which is something that Frieza ultimately feared, along with the fact that he feared the Saiyans will one day gain so much power that they would revolt against him, and that's why he ultimately wound up killing the entire race in a mass genocide of Planet Vegeta. Of course, later on this was somewhat retconned into where Beerus gave Frieza permission, you could still sense that the paranoia inside Frieza's head was building. Now, when Toriyama was first coming up with the Super Saiyan concept, it's pretty clear based on interviews that he wasn't entirely sure as to how he was going to make Goku look and how he would differentiate the way Goku would appear with this form. And prior to Goku becoming a Super Saiyan, we saw him use Kaioken and things that would sort of make Goku look bulkier and larger and have a different kind of aura. But this Super Saiyan was a totally new thing. And Toriyama once remarked that the reason as to why he chose to go with like a lighter sort of golden hair is so that his inker wouldn't spend so much time inking the dark hair for Goku, which of course was Toriyama kind of doing a little tongue-in-cheek joke. I don't think he was fully serious when he said that, but it's a great, brilliant idea to create something so iconic. Now, in Japan, it's commonly known in culture, at least it was back then, that people who had blonde hair were commonly seen as delinquents and Toriyama really wanted to express that not to mention that if you really pay attention to the overall aesthetic of a Super Saiyan you'll notice that they have a giant spiky golden hair and the pupils change color resembling that of an Aryan blonde hair blue or green eyed individual a pure blood according to many historical doctrines when you have that hair and eyes but also if you really pay attention you can notice that Toriyama will draw the eyes very differently when in Super Saiyan form, the eyes of these characters are surrounded by an outline like villains. And this was, of course, Toriyama wanting to showcase the anger and rage that must be present for a character to achieve this power. Now, one of the most commonly 
quoted lines from the English dub is when it's said that Super Saiyan comes from a need, not a desire. Now, that's only in the English dub, not in the manga, not in the Japanese version, and actually contradicts a lot of the things that we find out about Super Saiyan as the series progresses. For example, we know that when Goku first became a Super Saiyan in Dragon Ball Manga Chapter 317, which correlates to Dragon Ball Z Episode 95, we know that Goku triggered the form not just from all his training he was doing, but because he saw his best friend die right in front of him, and that triggered an incredible sense of anger and rage. But you can't say there's not a desire there when it came to other characters. For example, in the Cell Saga, characters like Future Trunks in the Trunks TV special, Vegeta in flashbacks, and of course Gohan desiring the power training and training and training and eventually achieving it. But then later on, characters like Goten and Trunks don't appear to have struggled whatsoever, at least in comparison to previous Super Saiyans. This, of course, would be explained recently in 2018 with Toriyama's very controversial introduction of S-Cells, which we're going to get to here shortly. In Dragon Ball Z Episode 66, after witnessing Goku one-shot the seemingly invincible Raccoon from the Ginyu Force, Vegeta narrates a flashback where he illustrates the power of a Super Saiyan and the legend, and at one time, this was considered nothing but a myth and just superstition, and he states that we have not seen a Super Saiyan for over a thousand years prior to the Frieza Saga. Now, obviously, Goku's transformation was totally triggered by his rage and anger against Frieza, and Vegeta's, which would be explained later on in Dragon Ball during the fight with the artificial humans, the androids, his would be triggered by his desire to surpass or become equal to Goku after witnessing both Goku and the mysterious youth from the future, Trunks, also achieving the form. It was shocking to him that there was another Super Saiyan besides just Goku, and this was enough for him to say, hey, I'm slacking, I gotta catch up. Now, it was implied that you have to have a pure heart to be a Super Saiyan, and Vegeta, of course, snarkingly remarks that he's got a pure heart, but it's pure evil, which was probably him just talking trash. I don't think we should put too much stock into that quote. With the early Super Saiyans, not only did you have to have an incredible amount of rage and anger, but you also had to do an extensive amount of training to achieve the form, to prepare your body for the form. But in more recent incarnations of Dragon Ball overall, there's obviously different pathways to take. Because when you watch Dragon Ball or when you read the manga, there are many moments where Goku is indeed filled with rage. One big example is when Krillin was killed at the end of the 22nd Tenkaichi Budokai by Tambourine. Goku was filled with rage but did not trigger the transformation despite being a lifelong martial artist and being very angry, which, as I stated before, as Toriyama continued to write the manga, he would sort of retcon and change the conditions for becoming a Super Saiyan. When we get to Goten, for example, he was able to obtain Super Saiyan not only at a very young age, but also more instinctively rather than as a result of anger. Now, throughout the years, many fans have theorized that the reasons as to why Goten and Trunks were able to achieve the form at such a young age with seemingly no real threat or no real need to do it is because of the fact that when they were originally conceived by Goku and Vegeta respectively, Goku and Vegeta had become so powerful that they almost transferred their energy, their power, through their sperm into, <laughs> this is wacky, but people believe that this is what happened, that that's why Goten and Trunks became stronger. Even though that's not explicitly stated in the series, it's very possible that because Goku and Vegeta's bodies were so much more powerful than Goku's was when he first conceived Gohan, that it is, you know, a theory that I think has made a lot of sense. But Dragon Ball Super really turned the tide when it came to explaining Super Saiyan. Dragon Ball Super introduced us to Universe 6 and the Universe 6 Saiyans from the Universe 6 version of Planet Sadala. We do find out that the Saiyans from Universe 7 were also in their version of Planet Sadala before Planet Vegeta was a thing and they would eventually migrate over, but we'll talk about that in a separate video. But what we find out from Kaba from Universe 6 is that the Universe 6 Saiyans don't appear to have any sort of knowledge of Super Saiyan. Now, Universe 6 Saiyans have some very interesting biological differences from their Universe 7 counterparts. Pure-blooded Universe 7 Saiyans have tails and can become great apes, 
whereas Universe 6 Saiyans have evolved past the need for having a tail. Besides that, Universe 6 Saiyans are seen more benevolent. They are keepers of the peace as opposed to Universe 7 who is violent, rage-filled, fighting enthusiasts. Now, it is not made clear exactly as to how many years Kaba and the other Universe 6 Saiyans experienced heavy combat. We don't know how much training Kaba actually did prior to his meeting with Vegeta, but when he did first meet Vegeta, Vegeta taunted him and punked him out and triggered the transformation based on Kaba's energy. Now, later on in Dragon Ball Super, when Kaba tries to teach Khalifla how to do the transformation, he talks about having a tingling sensation in one's back and then focusing the energy from the spinal area to tap into the form. Khalifla did it and she was able to achieve the transformation. There was no real anger here and no real rage involving this form. So it's unclear as to whether or not Toriyama just decided to give different pathways to becoming a Super Saiyan or if he just changed his mind. I like to believe that there are different pathways to achieving the form. Not only is it rage and anger with heavy training, not only is it recognizing the tingly feeling, which I did do a video with Kendamu in the past, showcasing and explaining where they got this idea from, and it's totally from Japanese martial arts, specifically Asian biological lore, which I will link at the end of this video for you to watch as we go into really in-depth stuff there. But not just those two methods, but also S-cells, which I think is Toriyama's most controversial explanation of how Super Saiyans work. So what are S-cells? In a recent interview with Toriyama in 2018, we found out that S-cells are microscopic cells found in the blood of pure blood Saiyans and of course their hybrid offsprings. Now what makes this whole Toriyama explanation of this interesting is that the amount of S-cells in your body the higher amount means you have a higher chance of becoming a Super Saiyan or of triggering higher levels of power, but it explains that the more gentle your spirit is, the calmer your environment is around you, the more S-cells you have. But as you train and get stronger, you develop more. And of course, eventually you trigger the transformation by having something happen that's traumatic in a way, and you become a Super Saiyan. Now, this explanation works to a degree, but it also falls apart. And it's very, very controversial and split down the middle when it comes to the fandom. Although the S-Cells explanation does help to explain how Goten and Trunks were able to achieve this power so young, because unlike Vegeta and Goku, they weren't raised in constant battles. Unlike the Saiyans of Planet Vegeta, they weren't always fighting all the time, which did make them get stronger, but they didn't have any peacetime. It appears like it also contradicts the entire purpose of having training and rage and everything that made up the Super Saiyan transformation in the original manga. So the way it's kind of interpreted by me is that the more S-cells you have, the more peaceful you are, the higher chance you have of achieving this power without needing the emotional stress. And to me, this could actually be the explanation as to why so many Saiyans for so many centuries were unable to get this power because they were always fighting and there was no actual peacetime and no purity, but it does, again, contradict the original manga in a way, but it also reminds me way too much of midi-chlorians and Star Wars fans despise the Force being explained to them through science, so I think here we have a clear martial arts Taoistic approach to Super Saiyan being erased by science, and that could bother a lot of Dragon Ball fans. Also, a lot of fans felt that this was just Toriyama trying to write his way out of a hole and write his way out of explaining as to why so many characters were able to get this form. Even Vegeta himself calls it a Super Saiyan bargain sale. At one time, the only real Super Saiyans in the original manga were Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, and Future Trunks, the two surviving purebloods that we knew about back then and their children. And then as the series progressed, we saw Goten, Trunks, Universe 6 Saiyans, later on Broly, when he witnessed his father dying, triggered that rage. We've seen this a lot in Dragon Ball, where the properties of becoming a Super Saiyan have changed. But ultimately, when you think about there being separate pathways to get to the form, that to me is the best explanation to where everything can kind of make sense. Am I covering up Toriyama's retconning? No, absolutely not. I do think that some characters get too strong too fast, but either way, that's the only explanation that really makes sense to me. And if you factor in the end of Dragon Ball GT, where we see Goku Jr. and Vegeta Jr., who have 
extremely diluted blood successfully transform, you can then figure out that that Saiyan blood and the ability to become a Super Saiyan is not indicative of how much pure blood you have in your bloodline. If you have any blood in your bloodline and some S cells, you can do it. Now, obviously, GT was written way before Dragon Ball Super and way before Toriyama came up with this, but it's almost like he's trying to explain things, but forgetting that, hey, what about all the angry moments Goku had when he was a kid? Or Vegeta's battles. Why couldn't he do it? It just, it's weird. For three decades, the Super Saiyan transformation has been the measuring stick in Dragon Ball for power and a pop culture phenomenon, but it was not the most powerful form in the series or even close to being the maximum level of strength that these characters could achieve. In the forthcoming editions of the Geekdom 101 Transformation Guide, we're going to take an in-depth look at the Super Saiyan mutations that came after the traditional base Super Saiyan. The golden haired form that Goku achieved on planet Namek, Super Saiyan was not the pinnacle of power for the Saiyan race, although it may have seemed like it at the time. Let's go back to Dragon Ball Manga Chapter 365 and Dragon Ball Z Episode 146. Goku awakened from his coma caused by the heart virus, healed up and determined more than ever. He and Vegeta could both sense it. They both knew what they had to do. Go beyond the powers of a Super Saiyan. Discover what was Super Saiyan beyond Super Saiyan. And that would lead them into a quest of self-discovery, a quest of bonding with their sons, and a quest to discover the pinnacle of power. But along the way, they discovered some very interesting upgrades to Super Saiyan. And we're going to be talking about the first one here on this video this edition of the Geekdom 101 Transformation Guide as we discuss what is known in the English dub as Ascended Super Saiyan. That is not the correct name for this form. The correct name for this form is Super Saiyan Stage 2 or Super Saiyan Grade 2. Super Saiyan Dai Ni Dankai. Let's get to it now. Before our heroes discovered what would be referred to as Super Saiyan 2, along the way they tapped into what was referred to as the Ichi Dankai no Henshin, transformations of the first stage. In other words, forms that went beyond the power of a Super Saiyan. And it was not until Goku truly discovered the nature of this power that he chose to completely bypass it, but that's a video for another day. For many years, these forms had several different fan-made terms, the oldest being from the early 90s website Toriyama.org, otherwise known as the Three Steps Over the Edge blog, by a man known as Curtis Hoffman, who was one of the earliest English-speaking Dragon Ball fans on the internet discussing the series before any of us could even dream of having websites, YouTube channels, or streams, or any of that. So Curtis Hoffman referred to these transformations as Ultra Super Saiyan or USSJ or Ultra Saiyajin, but those were sort of his interpretations of what the forms would actually be called. So if you've ever heard somebody say Ultra Super Saiyan, it's from Curtis Hoffman, but within the actual series, Goku refers it as Ichi Dankai no Henshin, transformations of the first stage, but Trunks and Vegeta refer to these as Super Saiyajin Dai Ni Dankai and Super Saiyajin Dai San Dankai, Stage 2 and Stage 3. And these titles would later be used in the Dragon Ball Guidebooks as official mutations of the first Super Saiyan series of transformations. So for this video, we're going to focus only on Vegeta's upgraded form, which the Funimation dub chose to call Ascended Saiyan, which is a bad name because they would use the term Ascended Saiyan not just to describe Vegeta and Trunks' Stage 2 and Stage 3 forms, but also to describe Super Saiyan 2 for a while, and all of that was just a dub term. The official term, like I said, is Super Saiyan Grade 2, with Grade 1 being the original traditional form that Goku had already achieved on Namek, and that later on Vegeta and Trunks and Gohan would also achieve. So, this Grade form was first shown off by Vegeta when he left the Room of Spirit and Time. His intentions of going into the Room of Spirit and Time was not only to surpass Goku, which is always his goal for almost the entirety of Dragon Ball Z, but also to break the limitations of Super Saiyan, and he accomplished it to a degree. Vegeta confidently left the Room of Spirit and Time, or the hyperbolic time chamber in the dub, to go confront Semi-Perfect Cell, 
which was Cell in his second form after absorbing 17. And this is when we first see Vegeta unlock this power. Or not unlock it, but show us the power that he did unlock in the Room of Spirit and Time while training with Future Trunks. So what happens is Vegeta powers up and his body mass, his actual size increases. And not only is he taller, but also his muscles become astronomically larger. Plus, it appears like his hair gets a little bit thicker. If you're keeping track at home, to reference this, check out Dragon Ball Manga Chapter 377, correlating with Dragon Ball Z Episode 155. Vegeta refers to himself as Super Vegeta, which a lot of old power level charts on old Dragon Ball Z websites from the late 90s would actually refer to the Ultra Super Saiyan form or Grade 2 or whatever you want to call it as just Super Vegeta and Super Trunks. But again, it gets confusing because there's so many fan-made names here that so many fans used for so many years that you have to remember that at the end of the day, it's officially referred to as Grade 2 or Stage 2. So Vegeta shows that after being in the Room of Spirit and Time for the equivalent of one year, Vegeta was a changed man. Just a few episodes earlier, a few chapters before this, Vegeta was getting his ass handed to him by Android 18. She broke his arm and humiliated him in that fight. Now we have Vegeta facing off against Semi-Perfect Cell, who one-shotted Android 16 after absorbing 17 and is a serious threat. Even Super Namekian Piccolo at the hands of Cell's previous form almost died, so this Cell was the strongest villain they had faced up until this point. Well, Vegeta showed off his new body, and it was too much for Cell, to the point where he couldn't do anything against Vegeta. So, of course, Cell being the intelligent character that he is, that also has Vegeta's genes, played to Vegeta's ego, vanity, and pride, tricking him into thinking that he might have a chance against him if he went perfect. So, Vegeta allowed Cell to absorb 18, become perfect, and well, we all know that Vegeta's decision-making skills in the Cell Saga were really, really dumb because he got owned. But nonetheless, we find out that Vegeta was not the only one to discover this power because Future Trunks, while in the Room of Spirit and Time, did also tap into Super Saiyan Grade 2 and actually went a step beyond, but we'll talk about that in the next video. Now, interestingly enough, in Dragon Ball Z Episode 165, which correlates with Manga Chapter 387, Goku also discovers these Super Saiyan upgrades, but he quickly realizes that neither of these forms were effective enough to battle against a threat like Cell. Now, a lot of fans have always said that the first Super Saiyan form to ever truly have the electricity was SS2, but that is not correct because with this transformation, when you see Vegeta really powering up, specifically when he goes for the final flash, you see the electrical discharge all over his body coming out. So the electrical discharge was used more so as a visual aid, as a way to amplify the power. Obviously with Super Saiyan 2, it was just there, even when Gohan wasn't even powered up, because it's a really high level of power. But even in this level, you see it there. You see the harnessing of the power from these warriors. But the big handicap of this form is the abnormal overuse of energy. The energy consumption in these forms is too taxing on the body for it to actually work in a long drawn out battle. Sort of like what happened with Frieza in his golden form and his 100% form where the power he was wielding was way too much and his stamina dropped quickly. And when you add that with the fact that Perfect Cell was an absolute monster, this is why Vegeta was taken out with a single elbow to the back and put to sleep. Now, this wouldn't be the last time that we saw these forms. In fact, it's kind of interesting. So in the manga and the anime, there's a big difference here. When Trunks and Vegeta and the Z Fighters face off against the Cell Juniors in the Cell game, in the manga version, the way it was drawn, it appears like they're using their traditional Super Saiyan forms or maybe even Stage 4, which again, I will cover in a separate video. But in the anime version, you can clearly see Trunks and Vegeta's muscle mass increase as they are using this power. And of course, there was a very brief cameo in Dragon Ball Super where we see the forms again. And if you really want to include this, Dragon Ball Z movies 8 and 9, the Broly and Bojack movies, we also see 
Vegeta and Future Trunks using these in between forms in those films. Super Saiyan Grade 2 was useful for a time, but wound up being a form that was in no way really necessary. But they did pay an homage to it later on when Vegeta used his blue evolution form. And when he did, he sort of resembled the muscle mass he had during this form. But that was the anime staff doing a, an homage or a tribute or a wink wink to Super Vegeta from Dragon Ball Z. Before we get into discussing this transformation here on the Geekdom 101 Transformation Guide, it is imperative that you watch the previous edition of the guide where we discuss this form's predecessor because I go into a lot of detail about the origin of the names and the story behind the previous form because it does tie in with this one. So on this video, we're going to be discussing the Future Trunks exclusive form, Super Saiyan Grade 3, otherwise known as Ultra Super Saiyan or sometimes USS 2. We're going to talk about it as part of the Transformation Guide. When Trunks and Vegeta both left the Room of Spirit in Time, it was obvious that they both got an incredible power boost. And this power boost is referred to as Ultra Super Saiyan by the fans, by Curtis Hoffman, but the official name per the guidebooks is Super Saiyan Grade 2. But Trunks was able to go further beyond. Now don't get confused. Grade 2, Grade 3 is not Super Saiyan 2 and 3. It is the mutated, upgraded version of Super Saiyan 1. So if we open up our manga to Dragon Ball Manga Chapter 386, or turn on, Dragon Ball Z Episode 162, we find out that Trunks got much, much stronger than we could ever think of, even more powerful than his own father in the Room of Spirit and Time. But one of the interesting things that Trunks stated when he tapped into this form is that he hid this power as a secret not wanting to share with his father that he had achieved this power because he did not want to embarrass him. However, the joke was on Trunks because not only was Vegeta aware of this power, but he chose not to tap into it because Vegeta was also aware of the major drawback behind this form. So once Vegeta ends up passing out at the hands of Perfect Cell, future Trunks lays down the gauntlet and challenges him to a battle of Mortal Kombat, not the game, an actual combat between mortals, and shows off Super Saiyajin Dai Sandankai, which is the third stage of Super Saiyan 1. Now, this form has an incredible amount of power and really shows the potential of the child of Vegeta and what half-breeds can do if pushed. At this instance, not only does Trunks get humongously larger, but his pupils go white, which mirrors that of the form that Broly would use in the Broly movie that would be released shortly after this episode aired. Now understand that Trunks came first. Toriyama drew this transformation in the manga way before the Broly movie was going to come out. So if anything, Broly's legendary stage was an homage to this form. Now in this form, Trunks has an incredible amount of power and does appear that he surpassed his father, but there is a huge drawback and that is the fact that as Trunks shows how incredibly strong he is to the point where he and Perfect Cell actually scorch the skies as they fight, Trunks could not keep up and touch Perfect Cell. Because even though Trunks may have been really, really strong, stronger than Vegeta, in fact, possibly the strongest Z fighter at the time, he could not touch Perfect Cell. And what good is being strong if you cannot touch your opponent? Because this form completely handicaps your speed. When it comes to multipliers of power, we actually do have a source, although it is not a Japanese source. One of the Spanish guidebooks called Dragon Ball The Legend of Manga states that this form gives Trunks a 10 times multiplier. Take that for what you will though, because it's not from the Japanese guidebooks. So it's up to you as to whether or not you want to accept that as gospel. Goku himself says the form may have great power, but what good is it to have this much power and this much strength if you cannot connect against your enemy? And thus Trunks realizes this after Cell shows him his mistake and the fact that even Trunks himself was arrogant in thinking he could win in this form and also naive. Cell tells him he's a failure when it comes to this transformation and Trunks concedes the fight. 
I've always loved this because it really is good character writing as far as I'm concerned because it shows that Trunks is a flawed fighter. He doesn't have the knowledge of Goku or Vegeta. And even Goku himself knew that these two forms were, let's just say, incomplete. Now, the other big drawback to this form is that it gobbles up stamina like crazy. Just maintaining the transformation, just doing that, even without throwing a single punch, quickly quickly drains your stamina and your energy and thus you get tired a lot faster and that to me makes this form an extreme letdown now a lot of people throughout the years argued that had it not been for the speed handicap trunks could have won this fight but when you actually analyze the manga and the anime there's more to it than that obviously trunks was very very strong but as far as competing against cell went there were other issues here. For example, Cell himself actually shows that he can achieve this form by bulking up and demonstrating to Trunks right in his face that there are problems with this form. So if Cell wanted to match power for power, he could have against Trunks. And let's not forget that later on against the fight with Goku and Gohan in the Cell games, and yes, Cell did train, of course, we have to factor that in, but Cell himself was really being pushed to his limit, especially by Gohan. And that tells me that Cell in this fight with Trunks was still conserving stamina and still holding back. So even though Trunks may have appeared to have been able to beat Cell, and maybe he could have if he had the speed advantage, Cell had many more tricks up his sleeve. And I believe that Cell would have still won the fight because of various factors. Plus the fact that he's in the Mechian, he can heal. And of course, there's other hacks that Cell has. But nonetheless... I think a lot of people overstate and overestimate Trunks' power here. I don't think he could have beaten Cell no matter what, even if he had a speed increase, because Cell also had this power too. And if you want to match power for power, at the very least would have been a stalemate, and that's not including Cell's hacks. So although this form looks cool, it's definitely one that even Vegeta himself in Dragon Ball Super refers to as being primitive. It's just not an effective form for combat at all. Goku says it, Vegeta says it, and Trunks, of course, realizes it, which is why he didn't really use this form in combat again, with the exception of the anime version of the Cell games, the fight with the Cell Juniors. We saw it one more time there, but after that, he realized that this form is just no good. But it wasn't the last time we saw the form. Dragon Ball Super showed that Khalifla was able to tap into this form, battling Goku in the Tournament of Power, but like with Trunks, just could not touch Goku because the massive muscles make you lose speed and Goku was way too fast, so she preferred to use her regular Super Saiyan form. Now, quick clarification here for all of you old school gamers who played Budokai. In the old Budokai games, this form is referred to as Super Trunks 2, and that is incorrect because the form is called Grade 3. So his Grade 3 is called Super Trunks 2, and his Grade 2 is just called Super Trunks. And some people actually call it Super Saiyan 1.5. In fact, it was called that in Super Sonic Warriors 2. So be aware of all the different names, Super Trunks, Ultra Trunks, Ultra Super Saiyan. The official guidebooks listed as Super Saiyan Grade 3. Or you can always call it what Krillin called it in the manga, Super Super Saiyan. Either way, it's a cool name. With Goku and Vegeta failing against Cell, the hope of the universe would end up being Gohan. And what they had to do is learn from the mistakes of their predecessors. When it comes to Goku learning Stage 2 and Stage 3 of Super Saiyan, the upgraded forms from the original, he figured that out really quickly, but he also figured out that they were not effective in battle, which is why Goku had to discover secrets about his own body and his own biology to really figure out how to become the best possible warrior to face off against the then recently perfected Cell. And thus, he had to discover what is known as Super Saiyan Full Power, Super Saiyan Fudu Power, but in the guidebooks is referred to as Super Saiyan Grade 4, which would be the key to having a balanced body and mind. And on this edition of the Transformation Guide, we're going to go right into Full Power Super Saiyan and how it works. So like I said in the intro, there's tons of fan names for this. Master Super Saiyan, Complete Super Saiyan. Daizenshu 2 was the first time this actually got the official name of 
Super Saiyan full power. That was in Daisenshu 2 because in the manga, it's never really called Super Saiyan full power. And it talks about in Daisenshu 2 that Goku's aura, while the Super Saiyan power is drawn to its limits, is very different. Now, there's no indication that Goku or Gohan are in their maximum power. And obviously, we find out when the fight begins with Cell that neither one, especially Gohan, was close to their absolute max. And there's always room to improve with this transformation. So basically what happens is, in the Room of Spirit and Time, Goku figures out that Stage 2 and Stage 3, the Ascended Ultra forms, the ones that Vegeta and Trunks used against Cell and failed, are powerful upgrades to Super Saiyan, but they're not effective in combat, especially not against Perfect Cell, who is not only very strong, but also very smart because he has the cells of a lot of the Z fighters. So Goku decides that they must work on getting rid of that instability, that restless feeling, and essentially taking the transformation of Super Saiyan and making it their normal sort of base form, transitioning that form into a new base form. So what happens is Goku and Gohan both leave the Room of Spirit and Time as Super Saiyans, and Vegeta and everybody else is stunned as to how strong and how unique they look here and Vegeta says they look like Super Saiyans but I don't feel any energy it's like their natural state. Super Saiyan full power becomes Goku and Gohan's natural state in the days leading up to the Cell games with the idea behind this being that if Goku and Gohan can make this their base form then they can power up from there so they're kind of going to be in this form calmly, peacefully as if it's everyday life which we see a lot more in the anime and the manga. The filler episodes in the anime really did a great job of illustrating their struggles, but also how calm and peaceful they were and how relaxed and natural it felt to be in this full power Super Saiyan form. It is more of a state of being kind of like Ultra Instinct, but it is one that took a lot of really intense mental and physical training to master because not even Vegeta or Trunks had figured this out at this time. So it's a very interesting direction to take their power. In the manga chapter following Goku and Gohan leaving the Room of Spirit and Time, we hear other characters discussing this new power that Goku and Gohan have tapped into. We know that it takes a great deal to stay in Super Saiyan. We know that, and we saw how Goku in Super Saiyan against Android 19 sped up his heart virus. It actually attacked him during that time, probably because he was straining his body. Vegeta pretty much realizes that in this power, they can minimize the strain on their bodies during battle and that it is indeed the best combat state. So Vegeta once again gets outsmarted by Goku. Now these events take place, if you want to reference it, in Dragon Ball Manga Chapter 390 and Dragon Ball Z Episode 168. So as we build up to the Cell games, everything seems pretty peaceful, although Goku and Gohan do struggle suppressing their power. Once the Cell games begin, we see Goku fighting Cell, powering up, and he proves to be in this full power form, stronger than anybody Cell's ever faced. Vegeta, Trunks, Goku has outdone them all, but even then, he is not strong enough to defeat Cell. Goku himself tells Gohan when Gohan asks him, were you going all out? And Goku says, I was, but I'm not sure Cell was. And then when Gohan starts to fight Cell, we quickly find out that Cell was indeed not going all out, and then we discover shortly after that Goku sort of had an idea that Gohan had a secret power inside of him, but he knew the only way to achieve the level beyond Super Saiyan, the true version of Super Saiyan above Super Saiyan, is to master full power, make it their natural state, and then sort of make Super Saiyan 2, as it would be called later on, the true power and true potential of a Saiyan. Goku realized that Gohan had dormant power in the Room of Spirit and Time, and that he would probably be the first one to achieve it once triggered properly, and that's exactly what happened in the series. But Goku later on would also turn into a Super Saiyan 2, as he, we found out later on. He figured it out in the other world after the end of the Cell games when he died. So what disadvantages does this form have? Well, the answer is none, really. In combat, it doesn't really have any real handicaps. We see Goku fighting at full speed, full strength, doing key blasts, performing at a very high level in this state, and best of all, he is not draining and he is not sucking out energy as he fights like Trunks and the others did when they fought Cell, specifically Trunks, so he was really losing power very fast. It really is the most effective way to do combat before Super Saiyan 
2. And Toriyama would somewhat reiterate this in a Psycho Jump interview from 2014 where he talks about Goku realizing that mastering his normal state and Super Saiyan would raise his level more and sap less energy and less ki than Super Saiyan 2 or even Super Saiyan 3. So again, that's an older interview and we've seen Super Saiyan 2 and 3 pop up in Super since then. Maybe that's an anime only thing, but we really didn't see much of this form after the Cell games. Now, what makes this form aesthetically differently, and I never noticed this until years after I had first seen it back in the day, is that Goku and Gohan's hair is a lighter tone of yellow. It's almost white in a way, which represents peace and tranquility. It's not quite white, sort of like Zamasu, and it's not quite yellow. It's somewhere in between. And I've always found that to be a very interesting take on this Super Saiyan Grade 4. From the moment that Goku woke up from his coma, recovering from the heart virus, he knew it existed. And after he met up with Vegeta, Vegeta confirmed the same thing. The Super Saiyan beyond Super Saiyan. And along the way, they hit a few roadblocks, namely with Grade 2, Grade 3, and of course Grade 4, which would be the key to unlocking the true power beyond Super Saiyan, Super Saiyan Grade 5, otherwise known as Super Saiyan 2. But what's ironic is, neither of those two characters would be the first to show us this power. It would, of course, be Goku's son, Gohan, during his fight with Perfect Cell, who unleashed a frightening power and would end up being the true savior of the Earth against Cell. Let's talk more about Super Saiyan 2, my favorite transformation from the original Dragon Ball Z anime on this edition of the Transformation Guide. After an entire arc, or actually maybe even an entire series worth of buildup, Gohan was the first one to achieve Super Saiyan 2 during the Cell games in Dragon Ball Manga Chapter 409 and Dragon Ball Z Episode 184. Now, the idea of Gohan having a dormant power is something that Toriyama had been teasing since the very beginning of the Z portion of Dragon Ball, the introduction of Gohan's character. With all the different fights Gohan had against Raditz, Vegeta, Frieza's forces, the Ginyu, Frieza himself, as well as tons of movie villains too that Toriyama did not write, but we always saw that he had potential to surpass his own father. And that's exactly what Goku realized while training with Gohan in the Room of Spirit and Time. It's almost like Goku somewhat subconsciously knew that Gohan would end up being the protector of the planet after Goku would eventually retire and or die. Now, obviously, Goku didn't know he was going to die when he was first training with Gohan. But nonetheless, he knew that at some point it would be Gohan's time to shine. And that would happen when Cell was just being a prick. He created Cell Juniors and was beating up on Gohan's friends and family. And then he steps on 16's head, which was enough to really push Gohan after 16's incredible speech to finally break his limitations and show the incredible power he really had. Now, this scene is one of the greatest scenes in the history of anime, in my opinion. And even if you're a hardcore dub fan, I know tons of hardcore dub fans who prefer the Japanese version because of the music, because of Nozawa's scream. And if you haven't seen the Japanese version of this scene, I don't know what you're waiting for. It literally is my favorite scene in all of Dragon Ball Z and a lot of people's as well. It's, it's incredible, incredible because of everything. But let's talk a little bit more about the transformation. So yeah, Gohan transforms into Super Saiyan 2 and ends up literally making mincemeat. Okay, not literally, but you know what I mean. Making mincemeat out of the Cell Juniors who had just been thrown down with the likes of Trunks, Vegeta, Goku, Piccolo, guys who were very, very strong. Gohan eviscerated them. You see, the key to tapping into Super Saiyan 2 is what Goku had talked about or discussed previously. Now, if you have not seen the video I've done on Super Saiyan Grade 4, which is full power Super Saiyan, watch that video because I go into great detail there about the whole idea that Goku had, which is, you know, getting Super Saiyan to be your natural state and then transforming upwards from there, which is what Gohan wound up being the first one to do. Now, when I called it Grade 5, I was not being, you know, facetious here. This transformation, Super Saiyan 2, some of you might know this, some of you might not, was never referred to as Super Saiyan 2 until Goku confronted Majin Buu in the Buu Saga when told him about the different transformations. Prior to that, 
all of the Japanese guidebooks, including the Trunks special pamphlet, refer to it as Super Saiyan Grade 5 or the Super Saiyan Beyond Super Saiyan. Super Saiyan 2 was not even thought of until the Buu Saga. This was the pinnacle of Saiyan power. And what makes this transformation superior in every single way to everything before it is that it has no problems. It has no handicaps. With Trunks' transformation, he was very strong, but too slow. With Vegeta, he didn't quite hit those levels of power needed to compete with Perfect Cell. With Gohan, not only could he compete with Perfect Cell, but he straight up surpassed him by who knows how much. Perfect Cell hit him with everything, and Gohan didn't even bat an eye and wouldn't even do any damage to Gohan until he came back as Super Perfect Cell. But I'll probably be doing a more in-depth discussion on this fight in the future because there's a lot of misconceptions here. I think a lot of folks really underestimate how strong Gohan actually is during this time. But Gohan was inspired to protect the Earth from 16's passing and the speech he gave him before he died. And I would say that this was a defining moment of Gohan's character. I mean, most fans point to this as being their favorite Gohan, which you can't really hate him for because he was a complete savage in this transformation. Now, when it comes to the aesthetics of this transformation, it's definitely something different but similar. What I mean by that is with grade 2 and 3, you saw kind of the muscular increase in the bodies. And with grade 4, you saw the hair kind of go more whitish, more light toned. With this form, the hair is thinner. Gohan has a very notable bang in front of him. And the other really big defining characteristic is the lightning surrounding the character using Super Saiyan 2. Now, what's interesting about the blue lightning is that you have to understand that because it was used for this form characteristically, that meant that in other cases, there were some misconceptions from animators and people working on Dragon Ball as to whether or not to incorporate lightning. We've seen lightning in so many other versions of power-ups and forms. So as a result of that, there are times where you see a character like, for example, Gohan in Dragon Ball Z Movie 10, where you can't really tell if he's Super Saiyan 1 or 2. And there's been debates about it, you know, on the web, because sometimes the animators would forget to do the lightning. I mean, that's just something that would happen when you're producing a weekly anime show. So even though it is rare, sometimes it would be difficult for some to figure out visually if a character was in 1 or 2. Really, it depends on how awesome they are, and they're pretty awesome, because like I said, it is my favorite form. Now, Gohan would not be the last person to tap into this form. Obviously, as the series progressed, both Goku and Vegeta were able to figure out Super Saiyan 2 during the seven-year time skip between the Cell Saga and the Buu Saga. So, both of them were able to demonstrate how strong they got during the fight with Goku and Majin Vegeta. You saw how crazy strong those guys had gotten during the seven-year skip. And the reason why this is my favorite form and why it's so effective in combat is because it has no drawbacks. It's just pure speed and power, durability, endurance. When you're in this form, it really is the truly upgraded version of Super Saiyan 1. Whereas with Super Saiyan 3, there are drawbacks to using that form, which I will cover in a later video. But that being said, Super Saiyan 2 to me was the most perfect transformation in Dragon Ball Z. Now moving past Dragon Ball Z, when we get to Dragon Ball Super, there are some new characters besides Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan to reach Super Saiyan 2. The big ones, of course, being Future Trunks, who was able to do it at some point when he went back to the future after the Cell Saga. And Khalifla did it at one time. Same thing with Kaba. We don't know for sure if Kale did it. I don't recall her doing it. She had her own thing. But those two were able to tap into Super Saiyan 2 and see how strong it got them. Now, here is a fun fact that many may not know. When it comes to Gotenks, the fusion of Goten and Trunks, we see them tap into Super Saiyan 1 and Super Saiyan 3, but did you know that in Daizenshu 7, the Dragon Ball Guidebook, it does state that Gotenks is able to do SS2. So even though we never actually see Gotenks doing Super Saiyan 2, he definitely can do it. Now obviously to some it's a no-brainer, but it's interesting that the Guidebook actually has it listed in there, even though we never actually see it with our own eyes. Now it's interesting because Gohan's power has always been fueled from his anger. In fact, most Saiyans, when they get angry, they're able to tap into higher levels of power. But with Gohan, it's different because he went through harsh training with his father. Then at the right moment, after a motivational speech from 16 and his destruction, Gohan was able to finally crack. And you actually see it in the series. He cracked and snapped and got into this form. However, with Goku and Vegeta, 
they trained and presumably nothing too, I guess, emotionally stirring happened to them during those seven years. So it's assumed that these guys just trained up, got to grade four, and then figured out how to go above and beyond that from there. And that's essentially how it goes for Super Saiyan 2. It's been debated by a few fans throughout the years that Vegeta was unable to get Super Saiyan 2 without the help of Bobbity making him into a Majin. But if you watch my Super Saiyan 2 Vegeta Explain video, I go into explicit detail with evidence from the manga and the anime itself with undeniable proof that Vegeta was able to do that form without the help of the Majin upgrade. And I don't think I need to tell you this because most of you probably already know, but if you don't know, Super Saiyan 2 is a two times multiplier from the traditional Super Saiyan form or a hundred times that of base form. So you are a hundred times stronger than your base form when you are in SS2. Again, my favorite transformation and my favorite scene from Dragon Ball Z, but the scene where Goku becomes Super Saiyan 3 is also great. Just because Goku sacrificed his life at the end of the Cell Saga did not mean that he was going to slack when it came to his training. During the seven year time skip between the end of the Cell Saga and the beginning of the Buu arc, Goku trained his body vigorously in the other world and was able to not only match power with Gohan when he figured out how to do Super Saiyan 2, but was able to go further beyond into the strongest Super Saiyan transformation from the original manga and the original Dragon Ball Z anime. I'm talking about Super Saiyan 3, and that's what we're talking about on this edition of the Transformation Guide. Although we're not entirely sure as to when Toriyama would come up with the idea for Super Saiyan 3, we do know that he had a couple of concept art designs prior to the finished version appearing in the manga. In fact, in one of the designs, we actually see Goku with the long hair, but also with a tail. And in the other design, it looks like Super Saiyan 2, except the hair seems to be more slicked back. Of course, the final version of the form would just be the very, very long hair, and of course, the lack of eyebrows, which Toriyama kind of put in there to make the form look more menacing than the previous transformation. So the first time we actually see Super Saiyan 3 in the story in Dragon Ball is in manga chapter 474 which correlates to Dragon Ball Z episode 245 which is when Goku is facing off against Majin Buu and realizes that Super Saiyan 2 is not going to cut it against a warrior that's that powerful and thus Goku showed that he could indeed go further beyond and no matter what dub you're watching this is a lot of people's favorite scene because Goku just rips it above the western capital and shows his great power against Majin Buu in Super Saiyan 3. Now we find out in the guidebooks that Super Saiyan 3 multiplier it has a four times multiplier from Super Saiyan 2 which equates to a 400 times multiplier from base form now keep in mind that Goku also trained really hard his entire body during the seven year skip so this base form of Goku is much stronger than any base form that we've ever seen before and the big thing about Super Saiyan 3 is that unlike some of the other forms that focused on stamina like for example grade 4 Super Saiyan 3 is entirely a machine built for combat and built for eliminating your opponent as quickly as possible there is a lot of energy consumption in this form possibly more than any other form in the entire series it increases your speed and your power significantly but it also has a huge handicap and that is the strain on the user and this is shown several times in the series when Goku first does Super Saiyan 3 he's able to match up against Majin Buu and get a lot of really good hits on him but was unable to finish him off now the reason for that is because Goku using just Super Saiyan 3 in this fight which was not even him at full power used up so much energy that it was still enough to actually drain the 24 hour period that Goku had on earth to come back to life for one day for those who don't know Uranai Baba has the ability to bring you back to life for one day but Super Saiyan 3 puts out so much energy that Goku actually eliminated several hours from his time back on earth because of how much energy he put out and later on in Dragon Ball Z when we see Gotenks fighting Buu we find out that the fusion plus Super Saiyan 3 put out so much energy that it greatly reduced the time that they were fused together before they defused. So it was believed that Super Saiyan 3 is a form that 
really can only work to its best potential in the afterlife. That's what many believe. And the reason for that is not just the examples I pointed out, but also later on in Dragon Ball Z during the fight with Kid Buu, Goku was so overconfident in Super Saiyan 3 that he thought if he could hit the full, complete power of Super Saiyan 3, he could kill Kid Buu. And when he tried to do it, his body would not allow him to hit the transformation it burned out and he went back down to his base form he used up way too much energy which is why i made that video saying that goku could not be fat boo because there was no way for him to have done it if he went to full power to be fat boo it would have completely drained his time on earth he would have had to go back to the afterlife and if he was alive it would burn out his body so the way that Super Saiyan 3 should be looked at in Dragon Ball Z is that it was an experimental transformation. Even though we don't have exact dates or times to when it happened, one could easily deduce that Goku discovered Super Saiyan 3 not too long before he came back to life and did not have enough time to perfect it. And as a result of that, his body just could not contain the power for a long period of time. Super Saiyan 3 is meant to be a form you use to end fights quickly because the more a fight goes on and the tougher your opponent is the more energy will drain and you'll eventually burn out that's just how super saiyan 3 works and unfortunately with somebody like boo who can regenerate over and over and over again and has more stamina than just about anybody super saiyan 3 is just not going to work because of that huge handicap now that being said one thing that I've always thought of is, how does Super Saiyan 3 from Z compare to Super Saiyan 3 from Super? And what I mean by that is, when Goku faces off against Lord Beerus, both in Battle of Gods the movie and in the anime, and the manga too, he gets smashed. I mean, it wasn't even a contest, but I wonder if by that time, since Battle of Gods takes place four years after the death of Kid Buu, I wonder if by then, Goku had finally figured out how to master Super Saiyan 3. I've always believed that it was the case because I feel like four years is plenty of time for Goku to really figure this out. But nonetheless, during the Buu Saga, the stamina drain was still a problem for Goku and the energy consumption. Without energy, you can't do anything. And unfortunately, that's what this form's big problem is. It still looks cool and it gave us some great moments like, of course, the Dragon Fist from Dragon Ball Z Movie 13. But... As far as combat goes, that handicap is just not going to work against somebody like Majin Buu. Now, the second person that we see doing Super Saiyan 3 was Gotenks. And we see that in Manga Chapter 493, Dragon Ball Z Episode 260. And in the anime version, Goten and Trunks were able to actually witness Goku doing Super Saiyan 3. And thus, it's presumed that with their training and their potential and the magic of the Metamore Fusion pose that Gotenks was able to figure out Super Saiyan 3 as one combined being as opposed to just Goten and Trunks being individuals. This has been a bit of a debate amongst fans for years as far as the quality of writing in this part of the series goes because it does feel like Super Saiyan 3 for Gotenks is something Toriyama just last minute decided to throw in there without any sort of buildup because there really is no buildup to this but the same could be said for super saiyan 3 when goku did it in fact there are manga chapters where goku tells everybody that he did his best against vegeta majin vegeta and some have taken that as toriyama retconning it to where he was hiding super saiyan 3 because of the energy consumption and because he didn't want to make vegeta feel bad or whatever the case is but Logically, it just tells me that Toriyama had not really come up with this transformation yet and wasn't really sure how he was going to come about doing it. But of course, we do have early designs of it, so it had to have been in his mind at some point. We just don't have exact details as to when that is. But nonetheless, Gotenks does show that he's very, very powerful as Super Saiyan 3 in Dragon Ball Z, but... Again, it killed the fusion, so even they did not know about the handicap of this form. But we are dealing with kids here, so obviously they won't know things like that, that Goku was able to figure out on his own. Even though Goku himself was overconfident and wound up burning himself out just a little while after during the fight with Kid Buu. Now, what's interesting about the design of Super Saiyan 3, especially in the manga, is that Goku has black pupils with blue and green sort of irises, whereas Gotenks only has the regular blue and green pupils. What's interesting is that in the original manga, Super Saiyan 3 is the only transformation, not including GT and Super and all that stuff, just in the original manga, that has irises and pupils. And Toriyama 
tended to really make that a, an effective sort of way to show that this transformation was all business and that Goku was not kidding around. So that, in addition to the whole, you know, lack of eyebrows thing, was a unique design choice by Toriyama. And I'm not sure how many fans actually picked up on that, but it is something that makes the form different, even if it's very subtle. Unfortunately, to this day, we have not seen how Goku or what Goku did to achieve this form. We know he trained. We know he trained really hard. That's all well and good, but we never actually see Goku using this form for the very first time in the other world like we've seen him do a lot of the other forms. We didn't see him do that here. So it's still a mystery as far as that goes. Now, the big question people have asked for so many years is, why did Vegeta never do Super Saiyan 3? And my best guess is because of something that Toriyama said in the 2014 edition of Psycho Jump, which I don't think he had even thought of back then, but it is a retcon that makes sense. Toriyama stated in the June 2014 Psycho Jump that Super Saiyan 2 and 3 are nothing more than just powered up variations of the original Super Saiyan form, and that if you keep training in regular Super Saiyan, you could increase your power beyond 2 and 3. So that tells me that Vegeta probably realized the handicaps of Super Saiyan 3's energy consumption and realized, let me just use two and power that up and get stronger in that form of course in the recent stuff we've seen vegeta do blue and god and a whole bunch of other stuff but we never ever saw vegeta do three other than video games and fan fiction and things like that but that's the best guess as to why there's really no other reason as to why except for that i don't think it's a power thing i think it's more so vegeta realizing that the form has weaknesses and thus chose not to even bother with it because i'm sure that that fight with boo kind of gave him some PTSD where he's like hey I can't get caught with a banana in the tailpipe in the middle of a fight which is what happened to Goku see what I'm saying so and with that being said that concludes the Super Saiyan in Dragon Ball Z Omnibus of Transformation Guides check out the playlist on the channel for more transformations and more videos as well thank you again take care and I'll see you soon